Hi. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon. I see someone typed lights, camera, action. Yes, let's go. Thank you very much for joining me. Hi, I'm Lei. Welcome to Lei's Real Talk. When I first joined, I didn't see any comments. I was a little surprised. And then um, and then I think, yes, now I have um, I see interactions. Okay, excellent. Excellent. All right. So um let's talk about this this spy, alleged spy case. Um I think it's 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 very eye-opening. Um I get excited <laughs> thinking that we're going to talk about this tonight. So the topic is why does Beijing want to punish its loyalists in the United States? Right? That seems odd. Um, a few days ago, Chinese authorities in the city of Shuzhou gave a life sentence to a 78-year-old Chinese American known for his staunch support to the regime. The man was accused of being a foreign spy. Um, the Chinese authorities didn't say which country he spied he, he spied for, uh, but because he's American, so I think it's obvious that he was. Uh, oh, he yeah, he was accused for being a, a, an American spy. Uh, the Chinese confiscated half million yuan worth of assets from him, um, and then so the man is seventy eight years old, and he will be locked up in China for the rest of his life. Uh, and this is the most severe sentence uh, given to spies. That means the CCP must be very upset with this old man. The harsh sentence confused many diehard CCP followers in the West, as they don't understand why Beijing is so upset that it wants to punish people who have pledged their loyalty to the regime. Um, the man's name is Zhang Xing Wen Liang. That's a mouthful to say. His Chinese name is Liang Cheng Liang Cheng Yun. So for this discussion, I will call him Zhang Liang for for your easy listening. What's unusual about this case is Zhang, Zhang Liang has been one of CCP's long-term friend, friends in the U.S. and has played an important role in, in the CCP's United From work, a.k.a. the Infiltration and Spy Network. So people say that if he is a spy, he would first be a CCP spy, right? So tonight we'll discuss, first of all, who, who is Zhang Liang, and is he an American spy? And then we'll discuss why does, Beijing wants, why, why does Beijing want to punish one of its supporters in the U.S.? And then, well, last but not least, what's the, warning? what's the warning message to those who work for the CCP um, outside China? So let's first talk about who is this guy. I have a picture of him. Sorry, where did it go? Here we go. So who is this? Who is he? Well, he uh, he's not from the mainland China. He was born in Hong Kong. He had worked at the United Nation. Um, Chinese media said that he contributed to the establishment of diplomatic relations between China and the U.S. years ago when he was working at the um, United Nation. United Nations. He was a community leader active in Texas and Oklahoma and was the chairman of the Liang Cultural Exchange Foundation. It's like the whole uh, people with the last name Liang, you know, belong to this, it's like, uh, like a, a homecoming organization. His most important title is the president of the Texas Association for China's Peaceful Unification and a board member of the same organization in Washington. As we all know, the National Association for China's Peaceful Unification, or NACPU, that's the acronym. Here I have a picture. Um, that's the NACPU is the, the Americans' translation of this organization. This is what you're seeing on the screen is the, the Chinese translation, which is much longer. Um, this organization its executive vice president is the CCP's minister of the United Front Work Department. Its president is the Politburo Standing Committee member in charge of infiltration and propaganda. In 2020, the, uh, the U.S. government labeled this organization as a foreign mission of the PRC. Yeah. 
And the State Department's announcement uh, also mentioned the Confucius Institute and Chinese People's Asso friendship association, you know, you have the friendship association with like in the United States or with other foreign countries. So these titles suggest that this guy has been an important, um, has been playing an important role in carrying out CCP's initiatives in the United States. And Beijing trusts him or trusted him. Um, otherwise, he wouldn't be given these titles. Um, so here you see him with Yang Jiechi, who was China's former Minister of Foreign Affairs and also the director, CCP's Director of Foreign Affairs, the highest ranking CCP diplomat. Um, this picture was taken in the hall, in the halls of um, the Great Hall of the People. Another picture with the same guy. And here you have this, uh, this picture says the banner says warmly welcome uh chairman his name Zhang Liang and another professor Chen um to visit our hospital this is um at, at a hospital in Lian Yungang so that's him and then here you have him wearing a vest that says can I see that it's it's blocking my own view uh, it says that Taiwan independence is uh, is a dead end, and China will on the other side it says China will definitely be uh, united. So <laughs> there there he is, right, making his political statement. Um, is there another picture of him? Yeah. So here here is him uh, under the banner the U.S. China Friendship Association. I mentioned the Friendship Association. So he is more likely, you know, if anything, people say he is more likely a CCP spy than an American spy. So why does Beijing accuse him or accuse one of its, its people in the U.S. as a U.S. spy? Was this guy a double agent? Um, although we can never root out the possibility that he is a double agent, I think the chance for him to spy for the United States is small. And let's compare his case to a similar case from 2015. So in March 2015, let me show you the picture. Uh, a Houston-based businesswoman by the name of Sandy Fan Gillis, also known as Pan Wen, Pan, Pan Wan, Pan Wan Fen, yeah. That's his, that's, I'm sorry, that's her Chinese name. So this businesswoman from, from Houston was detained in China on espionage charges. Before her arrest, uh, she had been doing business in China for almost 20 years and had established close contacts with CCP officials. She worked for the Shenzhen Economic and Trade Representative Office in North America, um, there's his picture, her picture, sorry. Um, make, I can make a picture bigger. There's North America Representative Office of Shenzhen. Um, and was the president of the Shenzhen Sister City Association uh, in Houston, or the Shenzhen Houston Sister City Association. The Chinese accused her of developing an elaborate spy network in China for the United States and arrested her. Um, now, I, I different from Tony, I mean, let's talk about the similarities first. So there are many sim similarities between the two cases. Both Sandy Gillis and Zhang Lun are Chinese Americans. Both are from Texas. Both had been involved in business in China for a long time, and both were arrested while visiting China. Now, the difference um, is what I want to talk about. What, what set them apart is how the United States and China reacted to the two cases. So let's talk about the U.S. reactions. Officials from the U.S. consulate, um, I think I have another picture. Oh, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me show her picture. So officials from the U.S. consulate in Guangzhou reacted immediately 
um, after her after her detainment and requested to visit her the next day. The U.S. Department, the U.S. State Department, issued a statement expressing concerns about her uh, about her well-being or safety and requested that Beijing remain transparent during the process and allow consulate staff to visit her frequently. And then the U.S. government started a long and arduous process to rescue her. President Obama, it was during Obama's time, uh, President Obama even used the high-profile G20 summit in Hangzhou, in Hangzhou, China in 2016, to pressure her release, um, people attending the G20 summit were surprised that um, that Obama used the op opportunity to pressure to tell her story and pressure her release. Um, however, this time um, we have not seen the State Department saying anything. John Long John Long was detained two years ago in April 2021. So it's been two years, and we have not heard anything from the U.S. government regarding his situation, uh, his detainment or release. Um, very recently, somebody from, I think it was from the State Department, just said, you know, it was a very low-key answer, said that they, they, they don't want to release any information due to privacy concern. Basically, there was no discussion about his case whatsoever. And the second difference is China's reaction. Um, after being detained for two years, Sandy Fan Gillis was given a three three and a half year sentence and deported immediately from China in 2017. Uh, so China didn't ask her to serve the full term, and the sentencing was more symbolic, right? Because uh, she had been by the time she was released, she had been detained for two years. Um, and then China gave her a three and a half years sentence. So they just let her, let her go. And Zhang Lun, however, is given a life sentence and he's 78. So it's very clear that China isn't interested in releasing him. And also in terms of the, the crimes that they committed, um, there's nothing said about what uh, Lun did, this uh, Zhang Lun guy did. Um, but if you Google Sandy Fan Gillis, there are quite a number of Chinese media reports detailing uh, her espionage activities in, in China. And they were quite detailed. Basically, they gave they also gave names of the people that she recruited in China, pictures, names, and what they did, and how she developed an extensive and impressive spy network for the United States. So, um, so the difference is striking. The difference seems to suggest that Sandy Gillis was important to the U.S., while John Lun doesn't appear to be, uh, be from, from the reaction of the U.S. government. From that perspective, some people argue that Sandy Gillis is more likely to have provided intelligent intelligence intelligence service to the United States, while Zhang Lun did not. Sandy was detained on March 20th, 2015. Less than two months later, on May 16th, the United States arrested a professor, a Chinese professor uh, by the name of Zhang Hao from Tianjin University upon entry into the U.S. on uh, economic espionage charge. A China analyst believes that the U.S., uh, persistently wanted Sandy Gillis' release precisely because she served the United States and therefore the U.S. government must protect her and, and, and worked on her, on her rescue. And the United States immediately detained a Chinese spy and negotiated with Beijing uh, to exchange him for Sandy. However, the long silence on Zhang Lun by the U.S. government indicates that he didn't provide service to the U.S. To the contrary, he has provided probably illegal services to, to the CCP. Um, so this is others' argument. Are you convinced with this argument? I must also tell you that Sandy, her family, and the U.S. government denied 
that Sandy was involved in uh, intelligence. So I don't want to say on record that she was an American undercover agent. I think you can decide for yourself um, the reason behind the striking differences between the two cases. Please also keep in mind that CCP has um, a track record of giving harsher treatment to its own spies than to foreign spies. Okay, keep that in mind. Um, because when its own spies betrayed them, it's non-negotiable. But foreign spies, you know, may be negotiable, um, right? So, so that's another cons consideration that you should keep in mind. Regardless, um, I think the chances that Zhang Lun is a U.S. undercover agent is small. Now, next, let's let's ask him, let's answer the question: Why does the CCP arrest him? if he's not a U.S. spy, or at least not an important one. Um, what does the CCP want to accomplish? Why does Beijing want to punish its own loyalists, its own followers in the U.S.? There are two possible scenarios. First, internal political struggle. Um, John Long was affected by the high level he could or he could possibly have affected by high-level power struggles. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the United Front Work Department have different uh, factions internally. And if Long or Liang, and depending on if, if you pronounce his last name uh, in, in, a, in a Hong Kong, in, in a Hong Kong pronunciation or the mainland Chinese pronunciation, if Liang befriended the wrong faction, it may cause his downfall. It's particularly difficult for overseas Chinese to know who is who in the CCP's power hierarchies. Um, it's not just overseas Chinese, actually anyone outside China, for, for, the, for Westerners, it's even more difficult, right? So it's really difficult for people based outside of China to know who is who in the CCP's power st structure. And if the official he had relied on, um, or if, if the official he had been relied on fell, fell from power, it can be dangerous to him. And there has been precedence. Within the CCP, factions have used the crime of foreign spy to strike down their opponents. Do you know who's the highest ranking foreign spy CCP ever had? Does that anyone here know? <laughs> All right, I'll give you the answer. I have a picture of him. Oh, not this one. Sorry. This is a, <laughs> this is, um, yeah, okay. Um, I missed these slides. I will just, this is the, this is the professor that was arrested on, on May, um, May 19th, two, less than two months after Sandy's detainment. Yeah, this is, um, pictures of her. Um, so here's the guy here, here, uh, on the left is Madame Mao. And then on the right is, uh, one of the three men in her gang of four. He was the highest ranking CCP official ever being accused of being a foreign spy. At the time of his sacking, he was a Politburo standing committee member and a vice premier. He was accused of being a Taiwan spy. Okay. So he is the highest ranking CCP foreign spy. But we know uh, he was accused of being a Taiwan spy for political reasons. It was, it was a, a, a crime. It was you know, against him to take him down. <laughs> so let's just show you an example. Possible that Zhang Lun had some dangerous liaison within the CCP uh, power circles without being aware. Um, it's it's likely, right? And this is this is probably, in my mind, the biggest risk for people based outside China to be involved in Chinese business or affairs. Most people don't know. Um, those people don't know the power structures or the shifting of the power um, alliances. 
and they're shifting so quickly. And by the way, you know, now that Jiang Zemin has died, you know, we used to talk about the Jiang faction versus the Xi Jinping faction political struggle. And, and so now Xi Jinping has this ultimate control over his Politburo or his Politburo uh, is made up of people who are loyal to him. But when that happens, what, ha what happened, um, what will happen or what is happening is people who are all his loyalists will divide because people will be competing for, for his favor, uh, for his attention, for his promotion or recognition. And that will cause internal division. That has happened to Mao Zedong um, in the 50s and 60s. So when you have a supreme leader who's all powerful and he, it, uh, people under him are not likely to challenge him, but people under him are more likely to compete with each other, to compete for his attention and recognition. And so that's still a factional uh, struggle yeah, within the CCP. And that's happening now. All right. So, so most people don't know that these political alliances, you know, who is who, and even lower ranking CCP officials don't know. So you will have to be at the very top to know, right, the, who, who is with who and who's against who. But they don't tell you at the very top. They don't tell you. That's why it's very difficult for, for, for foreigners or for people based outside China to, uh, to, to it's just very dangerous when you when they when they when they when they're involved in Chinese politics or businesses. All right, so that's first possibility: internal power struggle that caused his downfall. The second possibility, which is most likely and the most important one, is that CCP sus has suspected that he had colluded with the Americans. Uh, or have provided the United States with information. And if CCP is suspicious of him, it definitely wants to punish him. If the CCP found out or suspected that U.S. intelligence services, such as FBI, had talked to Liang uh, or had inquired about his activities in China, the CCP won't tolerate it. Because it's like a mafia organization, right? It sees you're talking to FBI as a tra uh, traitorous act. Um, and there's a precedence. In my May 4th program, China's anti-espionage law, I mentioned um, a New Yorker by the name of Li Kai. He's a Chinese American who was given a 10 year sentence. Here, here it is. For espionage activities, um, at a secret trial in 2018, he is in the business of, or he was in the business of exporting American goods to Chinese military and aerospace industries. So his business with China got, got on FBI's radar. So FBI approached him and talked to him about his business activities in China. However, the CCP saw that as an act of betrayal. He was arrested at airport when he returned to Shanghai. From, from the US and he was convicted of espionage and leaking secrets to the FBI by the Chinese. But according to his son who um, showed a, doc a document released by his son, the information he provided to the FBI was public information that anyone can find on China's internet. So Jiang Long is most likely in the same situation. The reason I say this is because of two, re two reasons. One is the city that he's based in, um, uh, uh, Texas, or, or his, the state that he's, he's based in, Houston, and the timing of his arrest. Um, he, he's, he's based in Texas and was detained in China a few months after the U.S. government ordered the close down of the Chinese consulate in Houston. The consulate was closed in July 2020, and Luo was arrested in April the following year. When the U.S. closed the, um, the, the Houston consulate, the Chinese consulate in Houston, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo called the Houston Chinese consulate a den of spies, a den of a, a spy den, a den of spies. Um, 
Now, being one of Beijing's most important community leaders in in Texas, in Houston, Zhang Long, Zhang Liang was held accountable by the CCP to explain uh, the consulate's closing. This is um, according to quite a number of um, China experts. Uh, it's impossible that the CCP didn't ask him the question, right? It's it, he's he definitely got grilled on on that. And similar to New York, the New York case, the New Yorker Li Kai, right? The the businessman um, from New York. I think the FBI might very likely have talked to to Liang to Zhang Liang and asked questions. So the act of talking to FBI uh, was perceived as being cooperative with the foreign intelligence services, and that's a violation of CCP's, CCP's code. Um, so it's the, Beijing right now has a has a loyalty problem within its network of spies and loyalists, whatever you call that, people uh, or influencers uh, who are scattered around the world. With the increased awareness of the CCP's infiltration in in democratic countries, some people, some of these people, want to distance themselves from the CCP or even want to cut the ties. However, CCP won't let you. Um, I think the heavy, heavy sentencing of Zhang Liang is sending a message to, to those people to warn them against collaboration with their respective local government. But does that tactic work? Well, last Tuesday in Boston, the, um, the president do I have any other pictures? Oh, that's it. Uh, I had a picture of this guy, but I didn't import it to my PPT. Um, but that's, it's okay. Um, so the Boston, the, the president of the Boston's National Association for China's Peaceful Unification, the same organization that John headed in, in, in Houston, um, the same person responsible for that organization in New England, his name is Liang, Liang Li Tang, was charged by the U.S. Department of Justice for failing to register with the U.S. government as a foreign agent, for engaging in interference activities in the U.S., and for spying on and harassing anti-CCP activists in the U.S., among other charges. So his arrest, and uh, and this is just one of the uh, the, the 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 FBI and the Justice Department have been arresting a number of Chi pro CCP Chinese community leaders in the U.S. Um, so they have been investigating and <clears throat> um, arresting these people work, who work for the CCP in the United States. So this got the Chinese um, confused. Someone asked this question on Twitter a few days ago. And I think it's a very good question. Um, the person said, I'm now a little confused. Spies who work for the CCP are caught by the United States. And spies who work for the CCP are caught by the CCP after they return to China. The person asked, what's going on? And someone replied. And the person said, can't you tell this is telling you, don't work for the CCP. When you work for the CCP, if you do a good job, the United States will, will come get you. And if you don't do a good job, if you do a bad job, you'll be caught by the Chinese Communist Party. So there's no way you can win. So just, you know, don't, don't stay away from the CCP. <laughs> That's not a joke. It's, it's real. I think people have already figured out that uh, this, with everything that's happening, you know, in China and also here, this is this sends a warning message to those who still work for the CCP outside China. And I'm not just talking about Chinese Americans, uh, like th th these two, the Zhang Liang and then the other guy from Boston. No, there are a lot, also a lot of Westerners who are paid by the CCP and 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 do things here. I think the same warning should be sent to them. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party doesn't trust anyone and, and is very suspicious. And they're fighting internally. 
and you cannot figure out their internal political struggle. And if you continue to work for the CCP, the U.S. government may investigate you. And because of that, the CCP will come get you as well. So no one will be on your side in the end. And you will be the loneliest person on earth. Um, you have no one to defend you. So uh, the Chinese have already figured it out. I don't know if the Westerners who are being paid by the CCP here get it at, as fast as the Chinese have. If not, then they should watch this program or we should let them know. Um, that's, that's my presentation today. And so let me see if people have any questions for me. And the, and, and my and and the Wumao here and the the the, the little pinks and Wumao here should get this message loud and clear. Thank you, Frosty Flake. Does Xi Jinping understand he's destroying Chinese society more than the CCP already has? I don't know if he understands. Um, I think at the very top, he's probably shielded from a lot of the reality that's happening. I think. People nearing him, near him, are afraid to tell him what's really happening. So he may not be aware of a lot of the the consequences of a lot of, of a lot of what a lot of his policies. So I don't think he's fully aware of the consequences. And I think he does not believe that he's destroying Chinese society. I I don't think I think he's helping. He believes he's helping. Chinese people. All right. From China Secret Police. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you have questions to me, put, put, my, put my name and my channel's name in the front so I know it's addressed to me. Okay, from IDK0. How do you discuss this issue with my friend? She's Chinese and has been here for 10 years. She doesn't believe the things I discuss with her. Well, you can ask her one question. Ask her if, ask her if, you have to do this very diplomatically. Ask her the question very innocently. Say, do you believe the CCP leaders really believing their policy, their 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 system, their the way they're running China. You know, really ask her that question. Um, if she says no, I don't think I don't think the CCP leaders, you know, believing communism anymore or believing CCP anymore. Then that gives you the opportunity to to further the discussion. Then, then do you believe? That whatever that they're doing works for China, right? If, if even if if they don't even believe it, then sh sh why should we believe it, right? I mean that that would give you the the talking point to start the conversation. If she says, "Yeah, I think they believe," I think they believe in what they do. Then ask them, ask her the question: the Why do they send their wife? Why do they all send their money, wife and children out to the U.S.? You know. Don't I mean? Don't we know that the the, the high-ranking officials all have sent their children and grandchildren, like to uh, to the United States, Canada, Australia, and send their money overseas? Then why why do they do that if they still believe in their system? You know, I, I think depends on what she says. Um, I think that would be a good start. Don't try to be ambitious in your endeavor don't try to convince her in one in one go that may be difficult uh try to take baby steps you know tackle one one topic at a time you have to be very strategic uh, about it because sometimes they could be very argumentative they argue with you and then you're losing this conversation so keep, keep them rational you know and then just ask the question and see what they say have them come up with their own answers. That would be a diplomatic way to address it. Um, uh, 
Okay, so here I have unconventional ideas. As someone who now has COVID, a mild case, how has COVID and the threat of getting COVID continue to affect the Chinese economy? Um, how has COVID affect Chinese economy? Well, that's obvious because in the past three years, China has been locked down extensively, right? We we saw the Shanghai lockdown last spring, from March to June, and so so it has affected China's economy. Seriously, how how will it continue to affect? Um, I think the biggest damage, the biggest harm, COVID has. Um, you could say harm from the from the regime's perspective, it's a harm. But from 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 another perspective, it could be a positive thing. It really allowed. It has completely destroyed people's faith in their government. They don't trust whatever the government tells them, which could be a good thing. Um, people just do not trust whether you know the, the people after three years. People don't trust anything this government tells them because COVID was the perfect example. Now, there are cases around the country. Um, otherwise, Xi Jinping and his people wouldn't be wearing masks inside, both indoors and outdoors. When he visited um, Xiongan, right, the, the satellite city, the, the second capital city, he, they were all wearing masks. So people were saying that, well, they were aware that the outbreak is real. Um, I think when... When the majority of your citizens don't believe in you, that's the biggest harm. It's very difficult to repair. It's not even just, um, like I said, it's not even a quantitative loss. It's a qualitative loss. Or it's such a great quantitative loss to a point that it, it will cause a qualitative uh, change. So that's that. Uh, so from IDK0, thank you. It's tough to talk about this with her. Um, well, then don't talk to her. Don't, don't talk to her about this. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'll have to know more to give you advices. All right, let me see. From kind of player one, Lei, are they in China still coming down on... Christians hear lots of persecution upon them. I think so. I think um, there's a, in, in general, there's a kind of an anti-West mentality. Didn't, didn't I play the video showing you uh, a woman, two women from the countryside watching their house, the Western style house being taken down, being demolished. The only reason is they don't like Western style, style houses. Um, so yeah, there, there are patriotic churches that you can go to and that those church, those churches, the, the clergy in the church are paid government official. They, um, they take a salary from the government. So speaking of the separation of state and church, there's none. So, so real Christians don't go to this, the patriotic church churches, um, so then you have the underground churches. Um, yeah, so those people are, are being monitored, uh, closely monitored. All right, so let me see. From Silas Larson, if the PRC could either keep Tibet or lose Taiwan permanently, which do you imagine that they would choose? I don't think CCP would choose. CCP is not... Uh, CCP does not have the wisdom to give itself the flexibility to choose. Uh, it does not. I think it wants both. I don't think it will say, "Hmm, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna give up that. I'm gonna negotiate." You know, um, let's create a win-win situation because the the thought, the idea you proposed is. Uh, a Western idea that we of, we often use in negotiation. Let's create a situation where we both win. I think it will not trade 
Tibet for Taiwan or the other way around. I think it, it will keep both. Um, Saint Saint, I, I'm worried that my candid communications with my Chinese people could endanger him or her fam his family. How can I speak candidly with him without endangering him? Don't use WeChat. It's very difficult. Yeah, don't use WeChat. Anything you say on WeChat is like transparent. Uh, it is very difficult. Maybe use landline. At this point, I think landline, the good old technology is good. I don't know if Chinese people still have landlines at home uh, or if you have landlines. Maybe that's the safest way uh, because they, they can't. Students in Chinese middle schools, I don't know if it's the case in college as well, are required to submit the list of apps on their smartphones. You need to tell your teachers what social media apps are on your cell phones. Yeah. Um, Uh, kind of play one. Do you know anything about Christians, people being persecuted? Yes, I, 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 I plan to make a video about a Catholic, a young man who's Catholic, whose mother is also Catholic, who fled China and, and crossed the border in Texas. He gave a very good interview and talked about his fam, his, his, um, ordeal in China and what happened along the way. He has three children. He took his mother, wife, and three children with him uh, to flee to uh, flee China. And he was there successful. It was a, it's a tremendous story. I hope I can make a video on that. Um, from Marcus Wilson, CCP does not care if the people trust them or not. So what is the harm? CCP doesn't care if people trust them or not. So what's the harm? Um, I don't get the question. Can you ask that question again? Are you, t are you addressing this question in reference to something I said earlier during my presentation? Uh, from Jeff Ramos. Thank you. How much do I have to donate to make you collaborate? For example, China Unscripted or ADV. <laughs> How much do you, do you have to donate to make you collab collaborate? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. A lot. <laughs> Should I say a lot? Well, actually, my my um, I have very limited time, and I feel like collaboration with them is good, but they do very similar work, and I think occasional collaboration is good, but then. Am I, are we really offering more value than what we're already doing separately? Because I spend so much time reading and, and, and researching. And so any other time seems to be um, a, a distraction because I really do everything by myself. So um, um, uh, other than my editor uh, who edits video for me. So I don't know how much value. I'm, I'm very conscious of the value that I offer to my viewers, you know, am I offering something? If, if it's something that you can get elsewhere, I try not to do it. If it's a view or a perspective or analysis that you can get elsewhere, then I, I try to not do it because you can get it somewhere else. So I'm very uh, conscious of that. Although I'm not, I think they're doing great work. I really respect them a lot. Um, I'm not against the idea. It's just a, a matter of being practical. And, and they're busy too, so so that so that's my answer. But thank you for the suggestion, Nick Levis. Thank you, thank you. Um, question, Marcus Wilson. Thank you for your candid sharing, your view, and your analysis skills. Okay, all right. So that seems to be the end, and I will end it here. Uh, I thank you for, for your donation and I thank you uh, for, for your questions. I'll see you over the weekend. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.